Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine on online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you're joining us from, we cherish your presence today with us. We believe you will encounter God through this time. So now let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, in this hour of worship, open our ears to hear you, our lips to praise you, our minds to understand you, our hearts to love you, and when we live, our hands to serve you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Lord, whose love through humble service bore the weight of human need, who upon the cross forsaken offered mercy's perfect deed, we, your servants, bring to worship, not a voice alone, but heart, consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. Call by worship to your service, forth in your dear name we go, to the child, the youth, the aged, love and living deeds to show hope and health good will and comfort counsel aid and peace we give that your servants lord in freedom may your mercy know and live hello i'm david haley one of your associate pastors here at Wrightsville united methodist church and I have the great privilege of leading us in our morning prayer this morning. So I invite you to uh, join with me in your hearts as I pray out loud. And I'm going to be pausing during the prayer to give you the opportunity to lift up the names of individuals that you would especially like to remember today. Let us pray. Loving God, in Jesus Christ, you teach us to pray and to present our petitions to you in His name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love for all. Gracious God, you have called us together to be a people who comprise the church of Jesus Christ. May your people be one in faith and discipleship, breaking bread together and telling good news so that the world may believe that you are love, so that the world may turn to your ways, and so that the world may live in the light of your truth. We especially pray today Lord, that you will bless our middle school mission team this week with safe travels, effective ministry, growth in faith, and a really good time. And now, Lord, be with those whom we now bring before you as we speak their names out loud.
Hear our prayers, O Lord. Eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ we pray. And as Jesus taught his disciples and still teaches us today, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now for the next few moments, we reflect on our stewardship, the stewardship that we have of all with which God has blessed us. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Uh, you can give offerings to God through attending a public worship service and placing them in the offering plate or by sending them through the U.S. mail or by giving uh, using our website or the QR code. Well, now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children or youth nearby who aren't already watching the video, now's a great time to call them over because I've got some things to share with them. Hey guys, it's Pastor David with the children's sermon today. And our children's sermon today is about a woman in the New Testament by the name of Lydia. Her story is found in the book of Acts chapter 16. Now, I'm going to need your help today. I want you to help me to tell her story. Now, listen carefully. This is what I want you to do. Every time you hear me say the word river, river, you're going to say gurgle, gurgle. All right? River, gurgle, gurgle. Right, you've got that one. All right? Now, every time you hear me say the word pray, you're going to say, Amen. Okay? Pray. Amen. All right, I heard you. And every time you hear me say the words purple cloth, purple cloth, you're going to say, Ooh, ah. Okay. All right, you got it. All right. All right. Here comes the story. So Paul and his companions went to the town of Philippi, and they remained there for some days. On the Sabbath day, they went outside the city gate to a place by the river. Gurgle, gurgle. The place was where people went to pray. Amen. So they sat down by the river. Gurgle, gurgle. And there were some women there who had gathered to pray. Amen. And they began to tell them, these women, about Jesus. And there was a woman by the river, gurgle, gurgle, that day, named Lydia. She was a businesswoman who sold purple cloth. Ooh, ah. <laughs> now, purple cloth, ooh, ah was very expensive, so she probably made a lot of money and had a very nice house. Well, Lydia listened eagerly as Paul told her about Jesus. And then she was baptized in the river. Gurgle, gurgle. Afterwards, she invited Paul and his companions to come stay in her nice house. I wonder if she gave them some purple cloth. Ooh, ah. 
Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. But that day, she went to the river, gurgle, gurgle, to pray, amen. And she learned about Jesus. And she may actually have been the first person who believed in Jesus after hearing Paul tell about Jesus. Wow, what a great story. And thanks for helping me out with it. Let's pray together. Uh, I'm, we're going to pray a repeat after me sentence prayer. And as I say each word, you pray, or each word, each sentence, you say the same words after me. Dear God, thank you for Lydia. Thank you that when Lydia heard about Jesus, she believed in Him. Help us to believe also. Thank you for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my great joy and privilege to get to bring you our scripture passage today. Our passage today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. Hear now this word. We therefore sent sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, if there's anything that I say that isn't from you, please let it be instantly forgotten. But God, if there's anything that I say that is from you, let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Where were you when you met the person that would change your life forever? I met my husband on the first day of orientation at Duke Divinity School. And I can still picture what he looked like sitting in that classroom chair under fluorescent lighting. Or meeting my childhood best friend on the first day of second grade. One whiff of a fresh pack of Crayola crayons will instantly transport me back to Mrs. Tapp's classroom and seeing Raina's friendly smile. And don't even get me started on meeting my college mentor, the dean of the theology department, for the first time. The way his cowboy boots clicked when he walked down the marble floors. We usually can't predict when we're going to meet one of those people who's going to change the course of our lives. I doubt that Paul knew when he woke up on a Sabbath morning in the region of Macedonia that he was about to meet one of his most important ministry partners, Lydia. At this point in his missionary career, Paul has a routine when he enters a new town. On the Sabbath, he goes into the synagogue in town and strikes up a conversation with the leaders there. But in Philippi, he doesn't go to a synagogue. Instead, he goes outside the city boundaries to a riverbank, hoping to find people there who are praying. Philippi was so predominantly pagan 
that there weren't even enough Jewish men to necessitate an official synagogue. Instead, Paul, Timothy, and Silas seek out an unofficial gathering of women who are interested in the God of Israel. When they arrive, they meet a woman named Lydia. Lydia is called a worshiper of God, which is a phrase that's used throughout scripture to describe a Gentile who's seeking the God of Israel. She's a dealer in purple cloth, which was one of the most exclusive luxury goods in the ancient world. In fact, purple dye was so expensive that it actually would have been cheaper to sprinkle your clothes with gold dust than it was to dye them with purple. Only the richest of the rich could afford it. So Lydia is regularly rubbing shoulders with the powerful in Philippi. We get precious few details about this first interaction between Lydia and Paul. He starts talking about Jesus and God works in Lydia's heart to receive the good news. She and her whole household are baptized. And then Lydia responds to God's grace with what she has, a house. Lydia's house will become the central meeting place for the Philippian church. This is the place where the Philippian church will grow to what we know it to be in the New Testament. After spending some time there, Paul travels about 90 miles or so to the west to reach Thessalonica. And once he gets there, he builds relationships by working among the people in manual labor. This gets referenced in 1 Thessalonians 2.9, where Paul writes that he labored day and night so that he wouldn't be a financial burden to anyone. But here's the thing. In the ancient world, you didn't just show up in a new town and apply for a job. There were trade guilds, organizations that you had to work with if you wanted to get a foot in the door. So how did Paul manage to get work so quickly? Well, what if it was Lydia, the dealer in purple cloth, who made introductions for Paul so that he could work in Thessalonica? It would be like if you were moving to Myrtle Beach and needed a job, and a friend here in Wilmington connected you with an open position. To open up possibilities for the gospel to spread astronomically, God used the ordinary means of friendship, business relationships, and houses. Sometimes God acts in dramatic, can't miss it, clearly supernatural ways. And we see that all the time in Acts. Tongues of fire that rest over heads but don't hurt them. Or an angel breaking Paul out of prison. But other times, God uses the ordinary things around us and within us to accomplish God's will. This is the overwhelming beauty of God's economy. The most mundane things in the world become tools of divine transformation in the hands of God. In our worship service in person this week, we'll get to celebrate baptism. And when that happens, great, God's grace is going to be poured out on a child. They'll be claimed and sealed forever as one of God's own. But it's going to happen using tap water. Water that all get from the sink, courtesy of the town of Wrightsville Beach. The same tap water that we use to brush our teeth or to cook pasta or to wash the dog. But in the hands of God, it will become extraordinary. If God can do that with tap water, what might God do with you? This is what I want you to take away from this message today. Your life is the place where God is working, and you are the tool that God is using. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Princess Bride. In one of the classic scenes, our heroes, Fezzik and Inigo, are, brief, are briefing our other hero, Wesley, on their situation. 
In less than a half an hour, they need to get into the castle of the evil Prince Humperdinck, break up the wedding between Humperdinck and Wesley's true love, Buttercup, steal this princess, Buttercup, and escape again. Their liabilities. There's only one castle gate, and it is guarded by 60 soldiers. And their assets. Wesley's brains, Fezzik's strengths, and Inigo's sword skills. Wesley declares, declares that it is impossible. Maybe if he had a month, maybe he might be able to come up with something, but not now. Then he says, now if we had a, only had a wheelbarrow, that might be something. Immediately, Inigo reveals that they actually do have a wheelbarrow just around the corner. Wesley replies, why didn't you list that among our assets in the first place? I would guess, in addition to being a setup for a really funny scene, that Inigo didn't think that a wheelbarrow was worth mentioning in the face of such a terrifying mission. What good could a wheelbarrow possibly be for storming a castle? Maybe he even forgot that they had one until Wesley mentioned it. Here's the truth. We all have more assets than we realize. Sometimes we're actually so used to our assets that we become blind to them, or we don't think that they're interesting enough to mention. But what we might view as humility, oh, what could I possibly have to offer, is actually limiting what God might be capable of using. We need to take inventory of our assets so we can notice when God is asking us to use them. Today, I want to walk you through three categories of assets that you have, your skills, your resources, and your relationships. First, your skills. My mom likes to say that the thing that you can do that you assume everybody else can do is the thing that you're probably best at. For example, I no longer trust my grandma when I compliment the food that she makes, and she tells me, oh, it's so easy. If I ask for the recipe, she'll tell me that she didn't use a recipe, she just threw it together. And then she'll list two dozen different ingredients combined using multiple impressive culinary techniques requiring tools that I've never even heard of. It's not easy, she's just a really good cook. So what seems obvious and simple to her is unimaginable to me. One of my favorite things about working towards our new extension campus, Wrightsville on Oleander, over the past year has been watching all of you offer skills to the project. Woodworking, sewing, painting, gardening, interior design, you name it, someone in our congregation has offered it in service. So many of these skills were offered with a, oh, this is really simple, or oh, this is nothing. But they weren't simple, and they weren't nothing. These skills, beautiful on their own, were of immeasurable worth when offered in service to God. Every single one of you has a wealth of skills. Whether it's a professional competency or a secret hobby, you have so much to offer. How might God use your skills to build up the kingdom? The next asset for us to consider is our physical resources. Lydia's resource was her house. She had enough room that Paul, Silas, and Timothy could stay and use the house as a home base for ministry. Lydia's house became the first meeting place of the Philippian church. It was where the growing community of Jesus followers in Philippi would gather to worship, to study the scriptures, to hear Paul's teaching, to pray, to care for one another. Many of us here at our church have benefited from someone sharing their physical resources. For the past three, three years, the Healy family has opened their property for us to use for our pig picking. And one man in our congregation has offered one of his resources, a billboard, in service of our mission here at Wrightsville. 
When you are going down Oleander Drive and you see a billboard sharing our service times, that's because God worked in this man's life to show him how his resources could be used. And God uses financial resources too. We can shy away from talking about money in church. It can feel a little bit profane. But in the hands of God, money can be a transformational resource. Even Jesus had people who were financially supporting his ministry. Sometimes God works through miraculous provision, multiplying loaves and fish so everyone has enough. And sometimes God works through the ordinary miracle of stirring up someone's heart to give of their own money to support others. Both of these expressions are valid. What resources do you have that God might use to build up the kingdom? Finally, we have assets in our relationships. Sociologist Rodney Stark did extensive research in the late 20th century about how people actually come to convert to a new religious movement. His findings are fascinating. The Church of the Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormons, are famous for their evangelical techniques. Specifically, young men going door to door to strike up conversations about their faith. But according to Stark, only about one in 1,000 of these encounters led to conversion. Instead, the incredible growth of the Mormon church, which is about 4% every year, happens through relationship. The study found that after three years of contact with a Mormon relative or close friend, about 50% of people converted to the LDS church. 50%. This research just confirms what the New Testament teaches us. Evangelism happens through relationships, not through marketing. When I was in college, I was involved with the campus ministry InterVarsity, and specifically its wing called Greek InterVarsity that works with sororities and fraternities. The idea of Greek InterVarsity is simple to use the existing networks of relationships found in the college Greek system to, as our mission statement said, plant communities of grace in every corner of campus. One exercise that we did together is called network mapping. I'd encourage you to try this. You can even pause this video and start right now by grabbing a piece of paper. You start with yourself on the center of a page. Then start drawing lines out towards the different groups that you're a part of. Maybe it's your neighborhood, the school that your kids go to, the Rotary Club, the people you surf with. Then you can list the people that you know in each one of those places. If you wanna take it even a step further, you can think of what networks the people you know are a part of. Then comes the really fun part you get to get curious in prayer and ask, God, where are you already working? What are you up to in these relationships? God certainly used Lydia's network of relationships. Paul met Lydia through a Jewish network by joining her at a Jewish place of prayer. But from there, Lydia introduced Paul to her whole household and all of them became believers. And then perhaps Lydia even used her business networks to open a door for Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. So how about you? Who do you know? What networks are you a part of? And how might God be using those relationships to build up the kingdom? Your life is the place where God is working and you are the tool that God is using. You have assets, starting with your skills, your resources, and your relationships. And just as God used Lydia and Paul together to change the face of their community, so too God is asking what we have to offer. Even the most simplest things 
can be transformed when they're given in service to God. How are you responding to God's call in your life? Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you that you are able to use ordinary things for extraordinary purposes. God, give us vision to see how you want to use our assets and give us courage to follow you wherever you go. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you go now from this place, may the Spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.